So in this video clip from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Will learns, Will Smith learns, that his dad has better things to do than spend time with him. And after trying to hold his emotions in for a minute, he eventually opens up to Uncle Phil about how hurt and rejected he is. How come he don't want me? Now the truth is, everyone in this room has experienced rejection of some sort. We may have been rejected by a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe we've been rejected by a spouse. Maybe it's that college we wanted to get into or that job that we really wanted. Maybe we've been abandoned by our friends. Maybe we were rejected by our parents. Maybe we've even felt rejected by God. And rejection sucks. It's terrible. When you're rejected, you feel hurt. You feel alone, abandoned. And the sad truth is, we all have to go through rejection in life. But the good news is, if there is good news that comes out of pain, like rejection, the good news is that there is someone who does not reject us. And that's God. God accepts us. God never walks out on us like Will Smith's dad walked out on him. We will never have to truly ask of God, how come he don't want me? And this is the message that Romans 11 has for us this morning. That God accepts us even when he could reject us. Now, you remember Romans, where we're looking at today, is a letter by this guy named Paul. Paul was an early follower of Jesus who traveled throughout the Roman Empire sharing the good news of Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection. And Paul wrote a number of letters that are now included in the New Testament portion of your Bible. And for the past year or so, Rooftop has been looking through Paul's letter to the Romans, his letter to Rome. And right now, we are in the middle of our series on Romans 9 through 11, Anguish and Hope. And good news, everyone. Today, we start Romans 11. So look with me at our passage for this morning, Romans 11, 1 through 10. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, 
a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Now, like a lot of the passages in Romans, this one is a little bit tricky. So to de-trickify it this morning, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to walk through this passage exegetically. That's your fancy word for this morning. You can write that down. Exegesis means to dig through a passage of Scripture so that you can understand it. Right? The goal is understanding. So first, we're going to make sense of this passage, looking at what it meant in Paul's time and in Paul's context. And then we're going to look at what this passage means today for us and its application. And through both of these steps, we're going to see this big idea that Paul presents in this part of Romans, and that is that God accepts us even when he could reject us. So, to begin making sense of Romans 11, 1 through 10, the first thing we need to do is understand what Paul has been saying in Romans. If you've been with us the past couple of weeks, you know that Paul has been talking a lot about Israel and the Gentiles. Israel is the people of God. God's chosen people from 2,000 years earlier than Paul even wrote Romans. God's covenant people from the Old Testament. And at this time, Israel, God's people, have not accepted God's Messiah, Jesus. And then there are the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are everyone else who doesn't belong to Israel. And by the time that Paul writes his letter, Gentiles have been following Jesus for about two decades or so. And so the early church is struggling with what this means. Why have God's people, Israel, not accepted God's Messiah while the Gentiles have? And so this is the big question that Paul has been dealing with in Romans 9 through 11. Can the church trust God if God has rejected Israel? And to this point, Paul has argued, yes, the church can trust God because God hasn't rejected Israel. If you were here last week, you remember Pastor Matt talking about how Israel has walked away from God. Romans 10.21 says, Of Israel, God says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. In other words, Paul says, You can't blame God for Israel's mistake. Israel has rejected God, and that's the reason they haven't come to faith in Christ. And so it's in this context that Paul is writing Romans 11, the context of Israel's rejection of God. And so Paul writes in verse 1, he says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. Now, the no here, by no means, is highly emphatic in the Greek. It means for sure no. Absolutely under no circumstances, no. Heck no, God has not rejected his people. He has been faithful to them. And so Paul says we can trust God because he hasn't walked out on Israel. It's Israel who is walking out on God. And so that's the first verse of our passage. And then for the rest of the, uh, our nine verses this morning, Paul gives three reasons he knows that God has not given up on Israel. And first, there's the argument from Paul. Look at verses 1 and 2. Paul says, For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Paul's reminding his audience, hey guys, I'm an Israelite. God cannot have totally rejected Israel because I'm an Israelite and I still belong to God. It's not how that works. God cannot have given up on Israel. The second argument Paul makes is the argument from the remnant. Now, as my seamstress wife will tell you, a remnant is something you buy at Joanne Fabrics. 
Remnant is actually a leftover piece of something that was once larger, right? It's a leftover. It's a smaller part of what was a larger whole. And so in verses 2 through 6, Paul recounts the story of the prophet Elijah from 1 Kings 19, how Elijah thought that he was the only part of the remnant left. He thought everyone else who was faithful to God had been killed. And Paul says, remember, audience, remember Romans, that throughout history, God has preserved a remnant even when it doesn't seem like it. And it has been through this remnant that God's acceptance has been most clear. And then third, Paul makes the argument from Scripture, that is what the Old Testament says about Israel and its rejection of God. In verses 7 through 10, Paul quotes three different passages about how Israel would reject God for a time. Now, uh, Paul is going to develop this idea further through the rest of chapter 11, so we're not going to really dig into that today. But the gist of what he's saying here is that the prophets have consistently foretold that even when Israel rejected God, he would still embrace them and accept them. And so it's for these three reasons Paul says God has not rejected Israel. If chapter 10 says that Israel has rejected God, the beginning of chapter 11 says that God is still faithful God is faithful to Israel even when they are faithless. And so for the original audience of Romans, these verses are communicating that God is trustworthy because God accepts Israel even when they don't accept him. Now, for those of us in this room who don't belong to ancient Israel, which I think is everybody, at least most people, Uh, What does this passage mean? The message from Romans 11, 1 through 10 for us is that God has not rejected us either. And in fact, not only has God not rejected us, but he also lovingly accepts us. Even when it doesn't feel like it, God remains faithful to his people. Even when we are afraid or feel alone, God does not give up on us. Even when we, like Israel, go astray, God lovingly accepts us. Now, there are some benefits to this acceptance. It's kind of like when you get a new job and you love the job, you're really excited to work with the people, and there's this really awesome senior pastor you get to, I mean, there's this really awesome boss that you get to work with, and you're really excited about the job because it's what God's made you to do, and then you come in to work on the first day, and your coworker says, hey, have you heard about this perk? Have you heard about this thing that we get to do, this vacation you get to take, or the fact that you don't have to wear a suit and tie when you come preach? Have you heard about that? And those, the job is good, but those perks, those perks are like the extra sprinkles on my donut. They just make it that much better. And when God accepts us, it's wonderful news. But then there are those extra perks on top of it. And scripture talks a lot about the advantages to being a follower of Jesus. God doesn't just save you from your sin. There are also all these other blessings that he gives you. And Paul, in our passage this morning, highlights two of these benefits, and I want to talk in the time that remains about those things. What it means that God preserves us, and what it means that God forgives us. What it means that God preserves us, and what it means that he forgives us. When I was an undergraduate, I had the privilege of studying abroad for a term at um, Oxford University in England. It was a great experience. It was great to go and just learn from world-class people in a very uh, cool, beautiful setting. And while I was at Oxford, one of the things I did was I would focus really hard on my schoolwork during the week so that on weekends, I could go take a trip 
and go experience some of the things that Europe has to offer that the United States doesn't. And so one weekend, I decided to go on a trip to Cardiff, Wales, which is on the same island as, as Oxford, um, but you have to take a train to get there, so it's a little bit of a commute. And so trains are very popular in England. Um, lots of people use them, and so I, I got to, took the train, uh, had a couple stops I had to make, bumping into people, right? But eventually I make it to Cardiff, and I get off the train in Cardiff, and I go for my wallet, and it's not there. And it, I did that thing guys do when they think they have their wallet and they don't. Someone had stolen my wallet. But not just my wallet, my ID, the only credit card I had, and all of my money, all of my cash. While I was in a foreign country, on a day trip, by myself, early in the morning. Now, thanks be to Jesus, or I wouldn't be here this morning, I had put my tickets in my front pocket, so I could still get back to Oxford. But I just remember sitting on the train, head leaned against the window, watching the countryside go by, and just feeling so small, feeling so dejected and alone and abandoned. And I said, God, where are you right now? Why am I in this situation? Why am I alone? Why couldn't it have been one of those other trips that I was on when I was with people? Why? And I would like to think that in some small way, my experience in Wales is par- parallels what the prophet Elijah had to deal with in our passage this morning. God, where are you? God, things are looking really bad right now. God, I'm alone, and I don't know what's going to happen next. God, help. And it's in these moments when we're feeling rejected, when we're feeling abandoned, when we're feeling alone, that God can step in and do away with our fear. It's in these moments that God, instead of rejecting us, preserves us. He sticks with us, and he keeps us safe. Now, with Elijah, this took the form of a message, right? Verse 4, but what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God is saying, don't worry, Elijah, you're not actually alone. There are other people out there. Even though you feel like you're alone, you're not. Now, God's preservation takes different forms. Elijah gets to hear an audible voice from God. That's kind of nice. I don't know about you, but I've never heard an audible voice from God when I needed to be preserved. But I have experienced God's preservation in other ways. For example, when I was feeling hopeless on that train, several things happened. First, the Holy Spirit brought me comfort. I cried out to God with all of my questions and all of my feelings, and then I stopped and listened. And God brought me comfort. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Or verses like, he will, he, that God will work all things for the good of those who love him. Or that he would direct my path. When we feel rejected and alone, the best thing we can do is stop and bring those feelings before God. The second thing that happened on this trip that God used to preserve me was uh, my family. Now, there's a pretty significant time difference between the United Kingdom and uh, the United States. Uh, So when my parents were uh, woken very early in the morning by all my phone calls and texts that I was sending them, they eventually woke up, they canceled my credit card, and they called me. 
And you know what? My parents were thousands of miles away. There wasn't really a whole lot they could do to help me, but they talked to me. They were there. They said, Jacob, we love you. Jacob, we're going to do everything we can to make sure you're okay. And just hearing their voices helped me realize I wasn't alone. And the third way that God helped preserve me during this experience was through my friends. When I got back to Oxford, my friends rallied around me. They said, Jacob, here's some money so you won't starve while you're waiting for your credit card. They said, Jacob, tell me what happened. And they listened. And then when things finally got back to normal, they celebrated with me. God used my friends and the community that I was in. He used their love and support to show me that I was accepted and to preserve me through the situation. Now, God works in these ways and in other ways to preserve his people. And simply knowing that God preserves us, that's, that's an intellectual thing. Right? That's something you keep in your head. Oh, God's going to preserve me when times are bad. But we humans, we humans are really bad at things we only keep in our heads. We, what we really need is some way to make our head knowledge hand knowledge and make it tangible, make it something we can actually do or feel or touch and experience. And so my suggestion for you this morning is to learn some tangible ideas from my whaling in Wales. First, cry out to God. Bring your feelings, bring your fears, bring your failures to him. Even when it doesn't feel like it, cry out to God. He will hear and he will answer. The second thing we can do is talk to someone. After we've cried out to God, find someone that you trust, find someone who will listen and share with them. Simply talking does wonders. And the third thing we can do is experience the community that God has given us. You don't have to feel alone. You don't have to be alone. The fact that you are here in this room this morning, whether you've been to rooftop one time or you've been to rooftop 150 times, means that you are surrounded by a community of people who love you. Rely on them. Ask them for help. God accepts us, but not only does he accept us, he also preserves us in times of trouble. And it's by crying out and talking to people and being in community that God most tangibly acts to preserve us and show us his acceptance. But not only does God accept and preserve us, he also forgives us. Now remember, Israel has actually been disobedient and obstinate. They're deserving of rejection. They done messed up. And this is true of us too. Each of us has messed up. We've all known the good we ought to do and not done it. Each of us deserves to be rejected and abandoned by God. But instead of rejecting us, God forgives us. Don't miss the message from verses 5 and 6, that there is a remnant chosen by grace, and if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. God's acceptance of us does not depend on us. God's acceptance of us does not depend on us, it depends on the work of Jesus on the cross. That's grace. While we were still stuck in our rejection, Christ died for us. And he forgave us. One of my favorite stories of forgiveness is that of Nate Saint, as told in the movie End of the Spear. 
For those of you who don't know, Nate Saint was a missionary in the mid-1950s, and he and a group of his missionary friends traveled to Ecuador to share the gospel with uh, a tribe called the Auca. The Auca were a very violent people. They did not like outsiders, but uh, Nate Saint and his group of friends said, we're going to share Jesus with these people anyways, and they went. And in early 1956, they actually made contact with the Alka. There, were, there are pictures of them together. And then less than a week later, Nate Saint and all of his missionary friends were speared to death by the very people that they were trying to save. And most stories like that end there. But this one doesn't. Because a short time later, Rachel Saint, Nate's sister, went to live with the Alka. And a few years after that, Steve Saint, Nate's son, also went to live with the Alka. People whose loved ones had been killed showed up to share the good news of God's love and forgiveness to the very people who had killed their family. That, my friends, is the gospel. That is what God's love and acceptance do for us. It empowers us to do crazy things like love the people who killed our families. And of course, God is the greatest example here because he accepts and forgives us even when we kill his family. Because earlier in Romans, Paul has explained that while we were still sinners... While we were still separated from God from our wrongdoing, Christ, the Son of God, died for us. And the lesson here is for us to go and do likewise. To be like Rachel and Steve's saint, who shared God's acceptance and forgiveness with the people who killed, in Steve's case, his father. Now, quickly, what does living as someone accepted and forgiven by God look like? I have two suggestions for you. First, it means forgiving others. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting what has actually happened or jumping into a dangerous situation willy-nilly, but it does mean taking seriously God's example of forgiving those who don't seem like they deserve forgiveness. And second, living as someone forgiven by God means living humbly. It means remembering that you're part of that remnant and remembering that there's nothing you've done to deserve what God has given you and then living in the humility of that reality. Here at Rooftop, we express this sort of humility by saying we take God seriously, but not ourselves. That's one way that we say, hey, we are sinners we are in need of this grace and extending grace to others every day as well. Instead of rejecting us, God has accepted and forgiven us, and we should respond in like manner. In Romans 11, Paul proclaims good news, that God graciously accepts us. Even though Israel was disobedient, God didn't abandon them. Even when we mess up, even when we feel alone, even when we feel rejected, God does not give up on us. No matter how rejected or abandoned you feel, I'm here in front of you this morning to tell you God loves you. God accepts you. And he wants to preserve and forgive you. All you need to do is ask, how will you respond to God's gift of acceptance this morning? Let's pray.